of the Untethered MMA podcast. I am your host, Mike Fagan. Uh, normally, I'd be joined by Matt Roth of Bleacher Report, but Matt Roth is currently in New Jersey covering the UFC on FX show that's uh, coming up tomorrow. So with me uh, today is fight linker Subbo himself, Derek Subbo uh, It's going, so- going solo with me. I don't know how he would phrase that. I think it's I think it's just the dynamic duo. It's Batman and Robin. It's how we started. I've been here every week. It's, yeah, it's it's it's, it's untethered MMA classic. Retro. Uh, uh, if you want to reach the show, call in at four one zero nine eight eight six five two five. You can reach us on Twitter at it's Mike Fagan or Derek at Fightlinker Subbo. And if you want to harass Matt Roth, uh, I'm trying to get him to call in from New Jersey. Give us like ten minutes. If you want to harass him about it. Get him at Matt Roth five one two. Derek, let's just start off with um, not the fights coming up this weekend. But let's just start off right away with what happened about a couple hours ago. Uh, Fedor Milanenko defeated Pedro Hizo in about a minute and a half over in I think St. Petersburg. Um, I just I guess first just uh, I assume you saw the fight and just what did you think? Did you I mean did you expect anything different? No, um, they announced Pedro Hizo as Pedro Hizo instead of Pedro the Rock Hizo because there aren't a lot of rocks with that kind of consistency. Uh, normally, a little bit of a firmer uh, molecular structure than uh, Hizo was exhibiting from the neck to the uh, waist. Pedro looked good, uh, solid, less than two forty. Um, you know, never been a huge heavyweight, but didn't look as flabby as he did for a couple of his last Strike Force fights. Ended it quickly, crowd went nuts, Vladimir Putin was uh, applauding heartily. So, and we were having this discussion a little bit on air. Uh, Fedor's retirement, Mayhem Miller made the statement um, the other week that fighters are retired until they need money. Fedor has probably structured it where he's never going to need money anymore. But even if M1 turns out to be the sham that we all think it is, and it goes completely under, when uh, the president of Russia for the better part of two decades is there applauding at your... uh, last fight i'm pretty sure it's safe to say that uh, you're set for life yeah we were talking about this before we went on air and you know i i guess i'm just cynical enough not only not only just about fight sport retirements uh, anyway but also um you know even if fedor on appearances looks like he's on the ends with the uh you know, the hip crowd over in Russia, you know, there's, there's always that cynic in me that, that, that worries that, uh, you know, he's being manipulated and exploited and his money is uh, not being managed correctly. I mean, we only have to look at Mike Tyson in the States, a guy that had probably at one point made the most money in boxing history. And then, uh, you know, was, is, I believe he went bankrupt at some point. Um, he did. He had to file for it and yeah. sued Don King for, I believe, $100 million that uh, he said was owed to him that he never received. But Fedor's intimate relationship as being kind of the promoter of his own fights and part owner of the company that was putting them on and co-promoting with Strikeforce, a lot of that had to make its way back to Russia. And again, the free market system is really what fucked Mike Tyson because he signed contracts and allowed things to happen with his signature and, and his knowledge or lack thereof that were completely legal. In Russia, what's legal is what they say is. So the crony capitalist aspect of that is really going to take care of him because I think he's part of the club now. I mean, it's still possible that he signed, you know, contracts that are going to fuck him in the ass. And, um, you know, I don't know. Just the fact that Putin's there watching him fight doesn't really give me any hope that he's on the uh, he's on the up and up in terms of what's going to play out in the future. But regardless of what what sort of monetary issue Fader was going through, uh, you also seem a lot more confident that he actually is retired. Uh, you were citing, uh, I believe, a Bleacher Report report. Um, it was actually an MMA fighting article that had an interview okay. where I'm um, asking Fedor, and Fedor saying, "My last fight was in Russia. My next, my uh, next fight will be in uh, St. Petersburg. It's going to be the last of my career." Interviewer says, "Are you sure?" And he says, "Yes, I think it's time to end my career." Now he said something similar, maybe after the uh, Where Doom fight. When I think it's time, I think it's high time, something like that. 
but this was before the fight. And from here, it really seems like a UFC or bust kind of situation at long last. And because of that, I think we finally seen the last leg of the fi- farewell Fedor tour, as I termed it a couple of years ago. And who'd have thought it would have ended like this in the middle of the day on a Thursday when nobody gave a shit? You didn't even watch it live, Fagan. You didn't watch Fedor's last fight live. Well, to be fair, I, I had a prior engagement uh, a that date. I had to. Tell him it was a date. I had, to go on a, I had to go on a date. A date that Ask was supposed it. to be... I, hope well, I, I was supposed to go like last night. Go. It, it was scheduled for last night. It got pushed back till uh, this afternoon. Um, and yes, I had to go, Derek. And it's more important. My social life is more important. It just than sounds Fedor. like an obligation. I had to go to the dentist. I had to go on a date. Well, I'm not going to cancel a rescheduled I date I, I went to watch Fedor. Just don't say I had to. It makes it, it makes you sound like you fucking... It's like pulling teeth. Did you tell her about the show? Is she going to listen to the show? I did not, actually. I, Smart uh, man. Smart man. <laughs> well, I've had, I've had prior lady friends wa- listen to the show. And some might still be wa- listening right now. One of the many 50s of you out there. Um, I don't know if we got plural 50s just yet. Yeah, that's true. That's, well, <laughs> at least one show we had it on the archive. We had 50s. Oh, um, which one? Was it the one with the, yeah. Oh, by the way, just a quick aside. I feel as good about my decision to not try to have sex with that woman as like any decision I've ever made. That was a good one. Well, vicariously, I, I regret the decision for you because I think it would be the best thing ever. Oh, good. Do you, have you, have you, do you follow her on Twitter? No, I don't actually. Er, okay. Maybe I do. Maybe I do. Well, give, give, her, give her timeline from the last few days. Look, see. What should I be looking for in particular? Um, um, things that just read it. I'm going to, I'll, I'll fill a little bit of air here. What else did you send me in this email that I haven't read yet? Well, I mean, I just want to keep talking about Fedor for a second here. I, you know, I, until he officially comes out after this fight and says, I'm retired, you know, I don't exactly believe that he's going to retire. Um, you know, it just seems like, uh, then again, I mean, from what I saw, I don't know if the building filled up, but from what I saw of the M1 show, um, there were less people there than than typically show up for prelims for the UFC. Did that did that change? It for- looked pretty. It, it I don't know if it was. I mean, the the arena there was a nice pop when Fedor finished it. The cameras, maybe they were really strategically placed, but it looked relatively full for the main event. Okay. Yeah, because I, I mean, I watched the fight, um, but I, I I was not paying attention to the crowd actually, and I forgot to note that because I, I earlier in the in the evening bef- i think it was right before the main card started or even when the main card started there was uh i mean you could see just like you know two or three people in rows in sections that just had no one else in them uh, i don't know if the floor level was a little more filled up but either way it's definitely an interesting way for uh you know fedor to, to end his career um you know fitting on, on some note being in russia uh against an overmatched opponent but um you know, my thing about Fedor with uh, the last couple of years has been, you know, people rag on him for, for taking these fights, but people also rag on him for not being the same fighter he was four or five years ago. And, you know, it's like people want to have their cake and eat it too, where uh, he's either this washed up bum, but he's also taking fights that are, are you know, quote, too easy, unquote, for him. Um, you know, if he's a washed up fighter, I don't mind him taking, you know, uh, cupcake fights to to – to make money, um, and, you know, and if he has no interest in trying to climb that mountain back to the number one spot, then, you know, if people are going to take fights against him and and, and they're both going to make money, then you know, good on them. Well, it's like the mount. It's like the mountain move. There used to be a semblance and a credible threats outside of the heavyweight division under Zupa's control or under specifically the UFC's control that Fedor could maintain his number one rating just via not losing to top 15-ish opponents over and over again, and then some top 10 sprinkled in there as well. However, when he lost to Ware Doom and then uh, Lesnar beat Carwin the next week, and he lost that number one spot, it became clear <clears throat> that the only way to get that back was to go to, go to the UFC, and that's the case now. So I don't know whether or not, I mean, if Fedor comes in, <clears throat> he's not like he's going to come in and fight Stefan Struve for his first fight. They're not going to do something like that. He's going to come in and maybe he'll fight, uh, you know, Cain Velasquez. Somebody do the Overeem fight that nobody ever got to see. That kind of um, trajectory for him. 
and that's a tougher fight than he's won. I mean, really, since the Arlovsky fight. I mean, he well, his last win at heavyweight, and uh, that wasn't Jeff Monson or uh, Hizo or Satoshi Ishii, was Brett Rogers. It's been a while since he beat a real credible heavyweight opponent. So I don't know if he wants to come back and immediately go to that because with his pay scale and his hype, there's no way he can come in and fight a cupcake first. Yeah, and. You know, even though he, he's definitely fought, uh, like we said, cupcake fights, I mean, he still looks fine. I mean, he, he I think he's a guy that, he, you know, you can insert him in the UFC right now. And, um, you know, I don't I know if he'd be top five. I don't, I don't know, know if he'd be top if five, a, but yeah. I think he'd be definitely a, a fringe top 10 at worst. Um, I think, uh, I'm just going to pull up the, the rankings right now. I, I think there's still a, a, good amount of guys that he beats on well i on, think you'd on, probably on. pick him to kick the shit out of frank mir i think a 265 frank mir poses some problems i think i think frank mir um if he shows up anything like he did in that junior dos santos fight he gets just gets murdered uh, i think the I, I think the danger for mir in that fight is the fact that he's not that fast and i don't and think his takedowns that, suck and his takedowns suck and i don't think his i mean his i don't think his striking would be able to pose a problem he would really need to get fader on the floor I, I I just and I just don't see him being able to 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 do that in a position that that works for him. Um, so I think he beats uh, Mir. I still think he's not a bad matchup against Verdum. I think Carwin's an interesting fight because Carwin's got power, but I think coming off an injury and, and takedowns, Carwin could probably take him down. I don't know about that. I really don't. I honestly don't know about that. It's Fedor such a teeny tiny little heavyweight, and that would really become into focus. I mean, if you put Fedor next to Pat Barry in a heavyweight fight. They're the same size. Maybe. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, at the same time, I mean, Carwin, out of the guys in the top 10, has to be the slowest heavyweight, right? Especially considering his back and neck injury. Uh, is Mike Russo top 10 yet? Uh, not according to the bloody elbow rankings. I imagine, obviously, if he wins on Saturday, he is. Of course, yeah. Uh, obviously, I think he still beats Noguera. I, st- I still think he destroys Barnett. I've thought that for a long time. and I can't believe Barnett's still top 10. Well, I mean, that's how the rankings are right now. I mean, that's bullshit. Fedor's, Fedor's number 11 right now. So, I mean, after Fedor, it's Travis Brown, Mark Hunt, Roy Nelson, Chicago. It's not like there's a murderous what, behind him. But what would Travis Brown do to Fedor? Fucking 6'10", bouncy-ass heavyweight. I don't know. Or 6'8". How huge is Travis Brown? I'm trying to get his height right. Because he fought Stefan Struve, and he wasn't that much shorter than him. Oh, I mean, even... He's, looking is at he 6'10"? Left... Travis Brown? He, yeah, is he fucking Undertaker's height? I don't fucking know. Why don't you look up yourself, son? Or is I your could. computer going to crash if you do anything? That's else? what I'm worried about. That's what I'm fucking <laughs> petrified of that. I don't want to Google anything. All right. All right. Travis Brown. I'll try to slow. T-R-A. But if you did, I mean, if you just look past 11 with Fedor, I mean, you know, I still think he beats Mark Hunt. I think he beats Roy Nelson, Chet Congo, Ro- Russo, Rothwell. Cole Conrad's an interesting fight. Um, we've never really seen Conrad fight anyone near Fedor's level. Uh, oh, I, th- I think okay. Well, for the record, I think Mark Hunt would murk Cole Conrad, as long as we're playing the MMA math game. But uh, Travis Brown is six foot seven, and he's undefeated. And who's his best win? Um, it should be Chet Congo because Congo should have been deducted again for grabbing his fucking shorts. Was that a draw? That was a draw, right? It was. It should Congo was deducted a point for gra- grabbing the shorts. He should have been deducted another one in the third. Derek, I'm going to recommend that you do absolutely nothing else the rest of the show besides talk on that microphone. What? I loaded that up 20 seconds ago. What happened? You, you had a little glitch there for a second. I got scared that you, I lost you, and I was going to have to do this, this show by myself. Don't be scared, Mike. Don't God, be... God forbid that I have to talk on my own. No, um, just, just watch the listeners plummet. Then you know why they're <laughs> talking that. All right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, that was today. Um, you know, if that was Fedor's last fight, then... I guess I want to ask you too, Derek, because since you've uh, you've probably been one of the most vocal critics, uh, if if this is Fedor's last fight, what is his legacy to you? He's Sting. We've had this discussion. He's Sting. He's sting. When Sting is inducted into the TNA Hall of Fame, you remember this day. I remember or did they that. already do that? If if Sting's in the TNA Hall of Fame, I remember this day. <laughs> because it's, it, because it's Fedor's last fight. It, it's the accolades. It's the end of her illustrious career, and it's happening in this little piss ant show. He's an amazing, you know, spectacle. He was an amazing athlete. He was the number one heavyweight in the world for like eight years or seven or eight years, and that's incredible. 
and that's his legacy. But he never proved it on the biggest stage, which sucks. He didn't make as much money as he could have. And he didn't fight top competition for the last few years of his career, which was disappointing. And when he did, he lost. I'm, I'm going to argue that when he was ruling pride, that was the biggest stage at the time. I, I, it, it, as far as uh, gate, absolutely. As far as people in the arena, Japan still has those records for sure. As far as total eyes watching between um, – UFC 100 and the cable fights that have happened. I don't think Fedor, I think he had the most watched fight there for a little bit with the first CBS fight, but now he's like fourth or fifth. Right. But what I'm saying is the, at the time pride was the bigger stage. Like that was the number one organization in the world when he was, no, he was, yeah, he was the number one heavyweight in the world. He was, and he was beating and they had the number one heavyweight division in the world at the time. I will give pride that. All right. Well, I think that's a pretty, I think it's a pretty fair and accurate, uh, uh, description of, of what Fedor means to the history of, of the sport. Um, but we do got some fights going on this weekend. Um, two Bunch shows. Up. Two shows, yeah. Um, and it will one, include the UFC's 2000th fight, which you included in your little list. Yes. Um, which is funny because I, I wrote that down, but I didn't actually list what the actual fight is or which show it was going to be on. Uh, uh, there, there is some fancy. I'm be sure to give credit to whoever we actually end up looking this up for because we don't do any actual work. This is, I don't think it's fight metric that tabulated this, but well, they were the first one that I saw that had no oh, okay. talked about it. So let's give them the credit. I will give them the credit, and I will visit their website, give them the page hit because I know it's at the top of their blog. blog. Uh, milestone alert: Saturday marks the UFC's 2000th fight. The UFC has held 1,981 fights to date. Uh, and there's a note here, fight metric like most others does not count Hoist Gracie versus Harold Howard from UFC 3 to be an official match, despite it being listed on Gracie's record for many years. Uh, that will make the seventh fight at UFC 147 currently scheduled to be, uh, is it Yuri or Yui? I, how do you pronounce that R? I, I, I believe it's Yuri Alcantara, isn't it? Okay. Yuri Alcantara versus Hakron Diaz, the 2000th fight in the promotion's history. Between 2001, 2000, two, between, two, 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 uh, between July 1st, 2008, and July 1st, 2012, the UFC will have run uh, 1,055 fights, meaning that it will have contested more fights in the last four years than in the preceding 15 years combined. Wow, I have amazing shit shape. That's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting we're, little. We're in fucking a bad shape. I mean, MMA hasn't grown at all in the last four years. It's a fact. Absolutely. Look at that set. <laughs> I love how you. I love how you manage to turn everything into some defense of the UFC. Well, I just I, you hear all this shit about how it's peaked and it's fallen off and they're losing people and it's not as cool as it used to be and people are wising enough and then you hear a statistic like that. I mean, get in the time machine, go back to two thousand and seven, find an MMA fan, bring them here. They'll shit their pants. Yeah, I know. I mean, I generally agree. I think the whole sky is falling, uh, you know, the UFC's in big trouble talk is, is very bizarre. I mean, I, I, you know, people always want to talk about, oh, well, you know, the, the UFC is not, uh, you know, fans don't have to watch every show anymore and that's a big deal. But I mean, as long as the company is making money, I don't see the issue. I mean, if, if fans are more willing to pick and choose at this point, then, you know, that's how... That's how it's really always been. I mean, there's always been big shows. There's always been smaller shows. I don't know. I, I've never really understood that 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 mindset. And I'm you know someone who's fairly critical of Zufa on on large. On oh, large in, 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 in totem, yes, I would agree with that. All right, there's somebody on my Twitter um, headline that said he still wanted to see um, Fedor fight Cain Velasquez. I need to address this real quick. Now that Fedor's been fighting these guys. Um, the higher guys, especially in strike force, last couple of years, he has some common opponents with some other ranked heavyweights these days. So you have Ware Doom with Overeem, and with Cain Velasquez, he has a common opponent in uh, Bigfoot Silva. So just watch those two fights and uh, tell me what Fader would do to Cain Velasquez. There is some uh, breaking news here on Twitter. Anton uh, Gurevich or Gurevich of Low Kick uh, tweeted: "Breaking Fedor retires. Quote: There's no." fantastic offer that could tempt me out of retirement i'm retiring to spend more time with my family there you go so that sounds like an as an official assuming uh i'm, I'm assuming anton is there i believe he lives in russia uh so that sounds end like of an era. something else end of, an, end era. of an era uh and then when when noguera finally retires that 
that trifecta of heavyweights and pride is that's the official end of that era. Yeah, sometimes I will um, hop on to my iTunes because I have some of the old podcasts I used to do with um, Fight Linker, and a couple of them were after Fedor losses, and you can just hear the kind of shock and inability to comprehend what you're thinking of Fedor losing, Fedor not being the top heavyweight anymore, kind of dwindle as the podcasts go on and as he loses more fights. <laughs> and as a, I mean, as of today... I mean, like we were talking about Fedor in the heavyweight division. It's not like this is a potential UFC champion who just retired. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting, too. Uh, you know, you've got Anderson Silva coming up against Chal Sonnen in the rematch in a couple of weeks. And, you know, we were dangerously close to having to. And obviously we've seen him getting, you know, get beat before in the past, but not ever, not since he entered the UFC. And we were dangerously close to watching him get beat by a guy who, you know, a couple of years prior was still a, a journeyman middleweight. And, um, you know, obviously he came back and, and won. But, um, you know, the idea of, of watching Anderson Silva lose in the octagon, it, 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 it's going to be that sort of strange of a feeling if it would have happened as when, when Fedor lost to Verdun. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the, the shock in the arena, if you go rewatch the Chael Anderson fight, you can tell it's a fervently anti-Chael pro Silva crowd. But they're just in awe of what they're seeing, you know, halfway through the third, halfway through the fourth. In times of the fight where a lot of people would be booing, there's just kind of this silence and this anticipation of are we really seeing the end of this era? And the end of an era, you know, I, you, you called me one of Fedor's biggest critics. I criticized the way that he handled his career and the way that he steered. But as a fighter, he did amazing things. And you can't take that away from him as far as his accolades and his record. Same thing with Anderson Silva when he loses. That shock doesn't. It comes from the legacy that they've built, but just because they lose doesn't mean that they've lost a step or the games move past them or anything. Anderson Silva's 36 years old. The fact that he's still doing this is nuts. Yeah, I, and I, I look forward to, I mean, you know, if, if, if Chow beats him uh, in a couple of weeks or, you know, if he loses a fight after that, um, you know, within the next couple of fights, you know, one of the main, one of the first articles someone's going to write is, is Anderson Silva done? You know, is, he, is can he handle the current crop of UFC middleweights. And, you know, like you said, like that's sort of a ridiculous statement. It's really reactionary to, to, well, especially if he loses especially... the chail. If he loses the chail, I imagine they'll do an immediate rematch. He's probably, yeah. it's not like he needs to work his way back up the ranks. It'll be do a rematch. And then if he loses that, he can either do the rich Franklin and fight for a while longer, or he can say, if I'm not the best, I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. And, and with, uh, yeah, with Chow, I mean, there, there's, I mean, unless unless Anderson gets just absolutely demolished in a way that's really unimaginable, um, it, it's hard to to picture the UFC not just just money wise not wanting to book that that rubber match. Um, but yeah, we got it, it'll yeah. it'll be automatic. I don't think it's written in the contract as like what's for uh, Bradley Pacquiao. So when you see all these people suggesting, oh, just do you know Pacquiao Marquez again and put uh, Bradley against you know Con or somebody, no, they have to do the rematch. Well, I, I I feel like Bob Arum can somehow figure out a way to get them agree to agree not to do it if he wanted to. But let's get on to this uh, Fox or yeah Fox show FX show uh, on Saturday or Friday. Jesus Christ, I'm tomorrow, man. I'm tomorrow. I'm yeah I'm I'm gonna Maynard I'm Guida. Up. Maynard Guida, uh, a pretty solid lightweight fight. Um, I you know I, I it's hard to picture uh, it's hard for me to picture Guida doing uh, much to to uh threaten uh gray maynard it's it's tough to see especially in a five-round fight and you'd think that guido in a five-round fight would have an advantage because of his cardio but maynard other than when he was winging punches trying to knock frankie edgar's head off doesn't really get tired that often he's a bigger better wrestler and he can strike at range so i don't see it going five rounds it's, you know, good for Maynard for getting a fight that isn't against Frankie Edgar for once. He'll probably end up looking really good. <laughs> yeah, and, um, you know, the, the the big difference between Clay and Frankie, I mean, they're both pretty high-paced guys um, with with pretty good wrestling. I think Frankie is on another level than, than Clay. But uh, the big difference, obviously, is that Clay doesn't have the same sort of boxing that, that Frankie does. So he, you know, he's going to pretty much probably have to play that that in out game and he's probably going to have to try to, to, you know, just get in close. And when he does get in close, stick to him and try to bring him down, which is going to be a, that's a tall order against a guy like Ray Maynard. 
Yes, I mean, there, the other fight that really interests me on the uh, main card is not the end of the Stout Fisher trilogy that we all wanted to see, but the uh, the Brian eversall Waldberger fight, because eversall has been making some noise about possibly moving down to lightweight after this fight, and I think he'd be interesting at 155. He'd be uh, big at that weight, a uh, crafty striker. For all his fights on his record, I think he's only 30, 31 years old, so it's not like he's, you know, a Chris Lytle-H guy trying to make one last run. Yeah, it is crazy though that he has uh, sixty, it's like sixty-seven fights, sixty-five it, right, it, fights in the yeah, tournament. sixty-five total fights. He is forty-nine, fourteen, one and one, and he will be thirty-two in this November. So he's like thirty-one and a half right now. Um, the actual most interesting fight to me, and it has nothing to do with the the fight itself, although it should be a pretty okay fight, is uh, uh the. The number two ranked light uh, featherweight in the world, Hatsui Hiroki, fighting on the preliminary card. Um, you know, I know the UFC is 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 really they're not afraid to bury a guy if they don't behave in the way that they want. And it, even if you know, it, I'm you know I'm making an assumption here that that that's the case here. But um, you know, regardless of the actual reason of why they're they're putting him on the prelims, it doesn't seem to make business sense to put the guy who's Probably next in line to fight Jose Aldo, um, not on on the main show. I mean, does that make sense to you at all? I mean, I, I'm trying to understand why, especially considering the other fights on the FX card. Um, you know, why they didn't make room for Hiyoki and, and and Ricardo Lamas. Well, yeah, they have a featherweight fight on the main card, which is Ross Pearson versus Cub Swanson. And I know that they like Ross Pearson, and he looked good against Diego Nunez in his debut with the weight class, but He's not the best featherweight on the card. That had that's Hatsui Oki, so he should be on the main card. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It kind of I think part of it is that it's no win all lose for Hioki. He if he doesn't beat Lamas, it's just a piece of shit loss on his record. If he does, he was supposed to. If he does it quickly, I'm sure they'll squeeze it onto the main card. But uh, the, I think that yeah, he they asked him for the title shot and purportedly he turned it down because he said he wasn't ready. And, you know, they're not so I don't think they're supposed to smile on that. But I mean, the alternative would be, oh, you didn't take the fight. We took we gave you no consequence or you didn't take the fight. We didn't give you get the hell out. And I think both of those would have been the wrong move. Well, we kind of had this discussion last week with the, the whole Shogun Glover to share thing. Like, I mean, do you honestly think that the Hilke should have just taken the title shot, even if he felt he wasn't ready? Well, I, I don't. How often does a fighter do that? How often does a fighter exhibit that level of not, you know, lack of confidence in yourself but self-reflection to say, I'm not ready for this, for a title shot? That almost never happens. I think they were a little taken aback by that, and I think it gummed up the works for them a little bit. They didn't want to do Aldo Coke this early. Yeah, I mean, but I, you know, I think for, for Hiyoki, the issue is that he's only had one fight in the States, and uh, I guess he had a fight in Canada. He's had a couple of fights in Canada, but those were... Uh... 2006, 2007, 2008, and and those weren't obviously um, in the UFC. Um, you know, it, it, even if to me, if it's just a, a, a him wanting to get more acclimated to fighting in the octagon and fighting in front of the big show and fighting in the United States, I I just don't see why that would be so offensive to the UFC. Well, I I don't know if it was so much like offensive might be the wrong word. I think it miffed up their plans a little bit. If this is a kind of punishment, then, you know, their their options are limited. They can't find somebody. They're not going to suspend somebody and sit them down for a while. We'd, we'd scream bloody murder if they did that and said, we're just not going to give you a fight for a few months. Good luck living off budget that you didn't think you were going to have to. What are they going to do? They, they have more control over boxing does because boxing promotions can't do shit to fighters that turn down fights. It, it, their options are limited, but I think this is an example of them exercising it where it's possible to say, look, if you're not going to take the title fight, then maybe you're not ready for the main card either. Just that kind of dick attitude, which is what it is. But I, there has to be a counterweight to the fighters. Their their interests are not the fans' interests, and they're not the promoters' interests. The fans, fighters, and promoters all have a different stake in the cards and how they happen and when they happen and who fights who. And it's the promoter's job to balance the two. So the fights, pro the fans wanted to see Hayoki fight. That's why they offered him the title shot. He turned it down. They have to do something. Well, my thing is this. It, it, it goes back to this idea that, um, 
you know, like guys that, that are willing to take fights on short notice or take fights against whoever, you know, guys like Josh Koscheck, I don't mind them getting rewarded. I don't mind a guy like Koscheck, you know, Rich disregard- Franklin. Rich Franklin, I mean, but disregarding like Koscheck's time in the Ultimate Fighter, like I don't mind a guy like him having, uh, you know, better job security because he's kind of been a company man in that sense. Um, it, the, the thing that that's just weird about it to me is that they're they're basically shooting themselves in the foot in order to, and, and again, we're assuming that this is what the deal is, but they're shooting themselves in the foot to to punish Hiyoki, um for something that really doesn't seem. Um, like that big of a uh, uh, an offense, like. Um, well, I don't think this is going to be a. I don't think this is a fight where if Hioki wins it, he gets a title shot. I don't think that's the case. I think. The well, and considering up, considering right. Aldo's injury, I mean, you know, just timeline wise, it's probably not the case either. But, but I mean, wouldn't you want to expose a guy like Hioki to you know the big audience of the of the the main show? Yes. And I disagree with the placement of it. I did. I think it is a reaction to him turning down the title shot. Remember when um, Kerry Collins was the uh, head quarterback of the Panthers? He was um, still their their uh, starter. He went to the coach and said, "I don't want to start anymore," and they cut him. So part of the promotion, you know, we want guys that want to be the best that are going to leap at opportunities and take them as they're presented. If you don't do that, then and it's hard to feel bad for the guy. But I do think it's self defeating. Yeah, I mean, regardless of, of what you feel about it in terms of Hioki's perspective, it just seems like a weird thing for the promotion to do on their own benefit. Um, right, right. I, I, I think it, you know, it's cutting off your nose to spite your face. Yeah. I mean, because you could, I mean, even on, you know, even just putting him on the FX show is a downgrade from, you know, he was on the, I believe he was on the main card of the, the Japan pay per view show. Um, I mean, so you can. Palaszewski, yeah. That's yeah, I mean, you, Palaszewski. You, could, you can punish a guy quote unquote by putting him on a smaller show it just seems totally because i mean at this point now you're just burying him on a small show already i mean obviously the the absolute worst is you put him on facebook on a fuel show but um i don't know it just seems like a weird overreaction to me um but is there anything else on the uh the, the show tomorrow that that really pikes your interest at all you mean peaks pikes it's, i'm not sure about that but um uh, i'm gonna look it up for you I, I, P I Q U E S. I think it's peaks. Nope, I, I'm wrong. Well, nope, I'm right. <laughs> be, Pike, be more confident. Pike, Pike as a noun is a feeling of ir- irritation or resentment resulting from a slight, but Pike uses a verb is stimulate or, or interest or curiosity. Yeah, I've been saying that wrong for a while. All right. Um, we'll see if Pearson can keep it up. Diego Nunez, very highly ranked featherweight, but seems to lose to guys that come down from lightweight to fight him. So I uh, don't know if Ross Pearson will be able to keep that up. Cub Swanson is normally good for a good fight, whether he's getting double kneed in the face in the first five seconds or whether or not it's a scrap. Uh, and then, you know, Stout Fisher, the trilogy we've all been waiting for. <laughs> you say that with the same enthusiasm that uh, the original Vanderlei Silva, Rich Franklin promo was for UFC 99. It's the, it's the fight MMA fans have been waiting for for years. Well, um, I, I, there was probably a time in like 2005 where there was a Rich Franklin or Vandalay Silva debate. It probably didn't last very long, but it happened. Well, it probably didn't last very long because Rich was never really at light heavyweight for much of his UFC career. No, he was the middleweight champion. And, well, I mean, yeah, the, the debate was between Chuck and Vandalay at the time. Right. And we figured that one out, didn't we? We did, kind of. Late. I mean, kind of. Chuck won. Yeah, but late in their careers. I mean, it would have been nice to see that fight a couple of years earlier. I think it, uh, it may have been finished, but I think it probably, I don't know if it would have, I think it probably would have been about the same. I think it probably the same thing probably would have had. It would have been a little fi- faster, a little bit funner. Punches would have been a little bit louder when they hit, but I think about the same thing would have happened. I think their power and chins went down at about the same trajectory. Perhaps. I mean, I, I you know, I, I do think that the, I do think that that fight was closer than a lot of people give it credit for. I'm not necessarily in terms of the scoring, but um, you know, I just don't think it was a blowout for Liddell by any means. Um, but we do have another show this weekend, and this is another MMA event that I will be missing for a date. Um, but UFC 147, the fight card that no one really wants to see. Uh, and the, the thing I worry most about, and I'm glad that I won't be around to watch it, is that uh, I, I imagine on Saturday, 
the timeline on Twitter is going to be the most annoying string of jokes about this show uh, since we've pretty much heard all of them leading up to the event for the past month. I'm going to agree with you on that, but part of me hopes that it's, it just turns out just like UFC 108. And if you haven't watched it in a while, pull it up, because almost every fight was awesome. You got to see almost all of them. So <clears throat> the people that wanted to make jokes during the card during that, they made them. But it was also interspersed with a lot of people going, holy shit. And then a lot of towards the end, like, wow, this was actually really fun. So I hope that the naysayers do get a dose of that. Because if the card sucks, then duh. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that whole... <laughs> That whole UFC 108 was fun thing was, I mean, the, the whole issue with it was that the main event sucked. And I mean, this fight top to bottom, like, I mean, you have two Americans on the show. Everything else is, everyone else is Brazilians that, you know, outside of Vanderlei and uh, Verdum, you know, unless you follow the ultimate fighter Brazil, like no one knows who these guys are. Um, so yeah, if you want to talk about the two main fights, I'm I'm more than willing to discuss them with you. But I have no knowledge of anyone else on the show. I kind of I'm yeah, that's kind of where I'm at too. But I am interested to hear your uh, perspective on where Doom Russell. I know that Russell is one of the uh, frequent punching bags of the MMA media, but the man is undefeated in the UFC. Uh, has some quality wins. Uh, has a style that makes it. He's very difficult to finish. And um, what do you think happens in that fight? <sighs> I mean, to me, as long as uh, Verdum shows up and looks like good Verdum, I, I have a hard time seeing Russell beating him. Um, also, who's the – okay, the, yeah, but Russell and Franklin are the only two Americans. Involved. Yeah. Um, you know, even just going back to the UFC uh, show in Chicago where he fought John Olav Einimo, um, you know, he, again, it's another fight that he won uh, convincingly, but he didn't look great that fight. And uh, Verdum is basically a better version of John Olav Einimo. Um you know, maybe he doesn't maybe he doesn't have the same sort of height, but Verdum's a Verdum's one of those guys too. That's a he's a big dude, and you know I think that kind of gets uh, he he's deceptively big. I think is what uh, it boils down to. Um, he looked big against Roy Nelson, but Roy is a six foot heavyweight. Uh, where Doom fights really tall. He that Muay Thai yeah. stance that he has it in the Thai plum. He can bring his knees up uh, very high, very fast. Um, I just think that Russell, especially in the clinch, I think that he can probably get the takedown from there. I don't think that he's going to be in the plum helpless like Nelson was for a large portion of that fight. Yeah, I do like Verdum in the clinch, though. I think his knee work is, is really, really good. Uh, but, you know, you, you just look at, at, you know, you talk about Russell being undefeated in the UFC, but, you know, he didn't look super great against Animo. And then like, in the Duffy fight, I mean, that's a fight he won you know, in the clutches of defeat. I mean, he was dominating. It was ha- hey, no, no, no. I got to disagree with you, right? It was halfway through the third round. And if you rewatch that fight from about a minute left in the second round, all the way through the third, Duffy's throwing this exact same combination where he either leads with an uppercut or he follows up with it. And Russell's timing it the entire time. So when he lands that right hand, it's the product of setting it up over minutes. It wasn't just some hail Mary lucky punch. I mean, if, if I'll have to rewatch the fight to get to get the uh... take my word for it. And his other win before Inamo was John Madsen, who was undefeated in the UFC and strangely got cut after that fight. I still don't know why that happened. The yeah, the Madsen fight, yeah, and he also beat Justin McCauley in his his debut in the UFC. Um, you know, I just think if you look at his record uh, outside of. Uh, when he fought Sergey Haritanov in his fifth fight at Pride 33, this is, you know, the biggest step up in competition that he's had to face. And, you know, he's 35 years old. He, he just never struck me as a guy who, who, you know, has real dominating skills in any area. And I think that's going to be a big issue against a guy like Verdum, who does have that dominating skill uh, in his jiu-jitsu. And I think uh, outside of, you know, maybe the wrestling game, Verdum's a, a pretty well-rounded fighter. Yes, and, it, you know, he he looked a little goofy against Overeem. I think that he has a loose kind of attitude in the cage, which I think can get him in uh, trouble against Russell because he's kind of all business in there. He's not particularly aggressive, but he's not, you know, beckoning people down to the ground after butt-flopping for the 30th time and shit like that. It's fucking... I, um... Where Doom's probably going to win this fight, even if you see Russell, and he, he's got a lot of wins by submissions, good north-south chokes, uh, arm triangles, guillotines, just kind of on top uh, squeeze chokes, and I don't see a lot of those working against Where Doom from top position, so that's probably a win for Where Doom. 
But, you know, where Doom's next fight is going to be against the killer. It's not like this is going to earn him that rematch with Junior Dos Santos that we've no. all been hankering for. Yeah. Um, and also, you look at Verdum's record, um, the guys he's lost to, Overeem, Dos Santos, Arlovsky, Nogueira, Karatanov. Like, that's... I mean, if you're going to lose the guys in MMA, that, you know, when it's the elite guys in, in, the, in the division, like... Oh, Karatanov's an elite heavyweight. This is a discussion I was having um, with Smoogie and with um, somebody who works at Bad Boy the other day. How do you define the term elite in MMA? How many elite fighters are there per weight class? Well, I mean, obviously, Haritanov is at the very, very bottom of that list. If if he's well, I mean, what, what, I'm, just, what, I'm just lumping what's him What's your cutoff? Group. For instance, like, is Brian Stan an elite middleweight? I mean, I, I, I think... I think a nice broad definition of elite is top 10 guys. I mean, well, when you think about how many guys fight, if there are 30,000 middleweights on the planet and you can beat 99% of them, wouldn't you consider that elite? Yeah, but I mean, you could, if you're going to extend that, you could extend that to other sports too. I mean, if, if, well, yeah, is every better... NBA basketball player an elite basketball player? Is Brian Scalabrini an elite basketball player? I'd argue that he is. Well, you're you're using the the broadest possible definition of the term, I think. Then, obviously, Brian Scalabrini against any schmo, uh, you know, pickup player, it's you know he's going to run. That? Well, how about any guy in the D League? Any guy that played four years in college and wasn't drafted and is busting his ass trying to make the pros, and he still can't because Scalabrini's better than him. Well, I think to be fair, at this point, I don't think that's even the case. I mean, part of the reason Scalabrini is on that team is because he basically plays a player coach role. But I mean, I mean a, okay, well, there. I mean, you can pick like the, yeah, last pick the other, like, yeah. NBA rosters. Some people like Jawan Howard, just some guy that's on the Heat because he doesn't cost that much. And again, player coach, you know, veteran role, that kind of thing. Is he an elite basketball player because he's in the league? Are you an elite fighter because you made it to the UFC when there are thousands of guys out there trying and don't? I mean, it's all relative to what, what you're basing it on. I mean, when I'm talking about elite fighters, I'm talking about guys in the UFC. When I talk about elite baseball players, I'm talking about guys playing in the major leagues. But would you uh, call Matt Brown an elite fighter? He's in the UFC. No. What I'm saying is I'm, I'm basing it relatively. Matt Brown is not an elite fighter in the UFC. Yeah, but if Matt Brown went down to the regional level, he'd have 50 belts before the end of his career. <laughs> he'd beat the fuck out of everybody. So what do you do? Like, how do, how do you turn it? I don't even know if Matt Brown beats everybody on the regional level. I do. I, I really, I, I, you go watch some regional MMA sometime, man. I mean, it depends on what kind of regional we're talking about, like Titan FC stuff or like, like actual Titan local. No, I don't think that that's more of a national promotion at this point. Titan FC. They put shows on a lot of different places. They bring people in from around the country. Um, I'm thinking more like you go to, like, if you just go around to Chicago, regional MMA is like Illinois MMA. All right. Whatever you say, uh, Derek. Colorado MMA. I go to the Colorado MMA shows all the time because I have guys, I have friends, and I have people that I train with and my coaches, and they fight on these shows. They have, you know, they I, they start with amateur fights on the undercard, and then they move to pro fights for the main card. And and these and a lot of these guys are garbage. Oh they yeah, and how bad it is. And the, and there are thousands of guys that are just working their way up, and they, if. You know, they'll talk shit on a guy like Matt Brown, but Matt Brown beat their monkey ass if they got in a fight. So what's elite? Well, that's what I'm saying. If, if you're talking about MMA as a sport and you're looking at the entire, you know, uh, roster of fighters in the world, anyone in the UFC is an elite fighter. But when you're talking about the elite of the UFC, you're talking about the top, in my opinion, the top 10 to 15 guys. Okay. I mean, so, I, <laughs> so we have maybe four elite fighters on this card on the the ufc 147 yeah, show or the worst card ever four elite fighters and they're all fighting each other right because I mean, it would be these four guys against cans i would even argue that you have one elite fighter and then three pretty good fighters and then a bunch you don't of guys. think Van well is vandalate it's Vandalay's top 15 you beat michael bisbee is he still top 15 he has to be. If he if he's not, it's a crime because he beat Michael Bisbee. He's t he's two and one at middleweight, and he beat Michael Bisbee. So, well, speaking of that, I mean, and this is kind of what I want to segue to. Uh, he's two and one at middleweight, but he is zero and one against Rich Franklin. Uh, the first fight was at one hundred ninety five pounds. Have split you watched? Decision. I did. I actually rewatched it. That was not a split decision. 
It was all three what? judges for Franklin. It was uh, two twenty nine twenty eights and one thirty twenty seven. Okay, okay. That, Did, that that threw me off. Have you have you rewatched it at all recently? A couple days ago, yeah. What did you? Uh, how did you score it in, on the rewatch? Uh, twenty nine twenty eight Franklin. I um I believe I gave Vandaly the third, or maybe it was the second. But um the I still remembered the ending crystal clear when um Franklin is throwing punches from the uh back and Vandaly's trying to elbow him from the front, and that's how they in the last ten seconds just throwing wildly. Crowd's going nuts. Yeah. I thought what I in the lead up to that fight, my prediction was correct because I thought that Franklin would just use his reach. I thought he was more of a technical striker. He was a little bit faster, that he could find a uh, home for his shots more often than Vandalay did. But I'm not sure about that in the rematch. I think that Vandalay is more acclimated to the weight class now. Um, it's closer to 185 than it was before. This isn't Vandalay's first time cutting below 205 like it was for that fight. And I think that Vandalay is going to win. That That's my prediction because I think that Franklin's skills have fallen off since that fight, whereas Vandalay has kind of stayed the same. So yeah, that's interesting. I still like Franklin a lot in this fight. Um, for the same yeah. reasons that I was talking about for my first prediction, just the accuracy of the striking, ability to stay out of range. Yeah, I mean, I I just think uh, I think the styles at this point, you know, you know, back in the day when 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 Vanderlei was, you know, people talk about Vanderlei being aggressive in the UFC. He's not. I mean, outside of a couple fights and a couple of of instances, he's not been the guy that's just constantly coming forward. Uh, I mean, he's constantly coming forward, but not in the sense of like overwhelming you. Um, there was no point in that fight with with Franklin at UFC 99 that I thought that Franklin was really overwhelmed. Um, there was a couple of times that that Vanderlei landed a shot or two that that stumbled him, and he kind of got himself on the fence. But he always did a good job of of defending and then getting himself off the fence. Um, you know, I, I I do think the biggest issue though, uh, and like you mentioned, is uh, whether Franklin's skills have eroded more than Silva. And also coming in on short notice, um, you know, I don't think it's a huge issue. Rich seems like a guy who's always kind of going to keep himself in shape. Plus, he had a fight scheduled uh, for next month anyway, so it's not a huge uh, change for him. But um, those two factors, to me, if, you know, if Frank if Franklin comes out looking old in this fight, uh, it's definitely a fight that Silva can win. I, I just think, you know, judging from what we saw in the first fight, and just judging about what we know these guys throughout the career. Uh, and where they are at this point, I, I, it's just hard for me to see this fight going too differently than, than the first one. And, and I think a replay of the first fight, A, wouldn't be a bad thing because it was a very entertaining fight, very competitive. Now, at no point did you feel like Vandalay was out of his league or that there was no chance for him to um, land a shot, as you said, and change the flow of, if not the fight, then at least a round. And I think it's interesting. I'm not one of those people that carries a shovel around to bury fighters as soon as they hit the ground. I'm I'm excited to see what Vandalay Silva still has left in the tank. I did not abandon him after the uh, Lieben fight. And I think that he still has a potential to make some noise at middleweight if he can stick around there a little bit longer. Not going to take the belt from Anderson Silva or anything like that. But, you know, as opposed to Vitor Belfort, this is a much sunnier looking outcome for Vandalay potentially. Yeah, I, I think the Vitor fight was... Uh, 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 it could have looked a lot similar to the first fight that they had way back in the day. Um, what did you think of, of Vanderlei and how he looked in the Kung Lee fight, though? Because I didn't really, I didn't really come away from that fight impressed with how he he, he looked, even though I he came thrilled. out with a victory. I, I was very, I was thrilled. He he took some shots on the chin, and Kung Lee, not really known for his knockout power, but has wobbled guys before, and Vanderlei did not exhibit that kind of Andre Arlovsky, Glass Joe. Oh shit, is this going to be the shot? You know, like when you were watching Chuck Liddell in his last couple of fights, just, oh, the first time he takes one on the chin, it's over. That I don't have that concern with Vandalay that much anymore. He was aggressive. He was selectively aggressive, too. It wasn't just, he didn't wing a bunch of uh, those crazy, you know, sandstorm fucking hook windmills until he had gotten Kung Lee up against the cage. Kung Lee's not nearly as evasive as Rich Franklin when it comes to escaping from that. And he didn't really put it to him until he knew that he could. And if he shows that kind of selective aggression against Franklin, I think that he can corner him if he can cut off the cage correctly, maybe land a shot, and then we might see a little bit of vintage. Yeah, I, you know, this coming out of that fight, I, you know, I, I obviously was impressed that Vanderlei was able to take a, a, some shots and and, and come back and, and beat Kung Lee. I just didn't really come away too. I, you know, I thought that was more of a case of Kung Lee losing a fight that he could have won. Um, 
if he had fought a little more um, defensively minded uh, than he did. Uh, I think he got himself into trouble and, you know, allowed Banway to hit him uh, in ways that, that I don't know if Franklin's going to let um, happen. Uh, and the other issue in that fight too, you know, Kung Lee versus, versus Franklin is that Kung, I've always thought Kung is a pretty small 185er to begin with. And Franklin's obviously a big guy at that weight. Um, yeah, I had Franklin beating the shit out of Kung Lee. I believe my prediction yeah. was that Kung Lee might die in the cage. <laughs> I've never thought Franklin had that uh, that sort of violence to him, but but yeah, I I, I thought that that Franklin was going to pick apart Kung Lee. I don't think there was really. I, I had a hard time seeing how Kung Lee won that fight. Have they announced the next fight for Kung Lee yet? What the hell is he going to do? Let me check for you. Um, he's got to still be hurt. I mean, he's you know 172 years old, so when he gets injured, it's going to be a while. Well, did he get hurt? Is that was that what happened? I thought they just pulled Franklin for the the Vanderlei fight. Maybe, and then they they just have Kung Lee sitting there waiting. He's probably doing a movie or some shit. Whatever happened to the Tekken movie? I was ah, here it is. Of, I was down to see that. Here you go. Uh, Lee was scheduled to face former UFC middleweight champion Rich Franklin. However, due to injury uh, to Belfort, Franklin is now scheduled to face Silva at UFC 147. Lee is now expected to face former title contender Patrick Cote. Ooh. I think Cote beats him. I haven't seen Cote in a while. I actually re- I went ahead um, just last night, actually, and I went back through Anderson Silva's career just to see what was up. And the Cote fight was in there. And last time I saw Cote, he was uh, eating Matt beha- on the behalf of Alan Belcher's slam. So, Yes, uh, Cote is only 32 years old. Um, you know, obviously he's... he's not in a position where he's going to be fighting uh, for the middleweight title anytime soon. But he his, his his three UFC losses, he lost to Silva in the title fight. He lost to Alan Belcher, and then he lost to Tom Lawler. Uh, but then he came back on the in the Canadian circuit and then took a fight in Brazil. Uh, he beat Caleb Starnes, Todd Brown, Crafton Wallace, and Gustavo Machado. Dude, Caleb uh, Starnes is still fighting? Yeah. I mean, that was Good. back April of last year. And he, <laughs> he took a fight against John Salter in uh, June of last year, and he lost that by KO, and he hasn't fought since uh, June of last year. Wow. Yeah, you look at his uh, you look at his record. Obviously, he lost the Nate Corey fight at UFC 83, and then he beat a guy named Chris Cisneros, lost to Hector Lombard, beat Marcus Hicks, lost to Fallon Nico Vitale, beat a guy named Nick Hinchliffe, beat a guy named Matt McGrath, and then lost to Cote and Salter. And uh, he's retired, apparently, according to the uh, end of the Wikipedia Yes. Page. So he is done now. Well, until Caleb Starnes, we hardly knew ye. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, are, are we both taking Franklin then in the uh, the main event here? No, I'm taking Vanderlei. Oh, you're going to take Vanderlei? Oh, yeah, that's I, right. I, I, I think that – I just think that their trajectories have gone a little bit – when it's these old guys, it's just a matter of who's falling down the hill faster. And I think it's Franklin at this point. And that's not really due to his performance or anything. I think the shoulder surgery is going to fuck him up a little bit. It's going to take a little bit off his cross. I don't know. I, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. Fine. <laughs> I, yeah. So anyway. Hey, drink a cup of piss if my guy wins. Oh, wait, that's a really stupid. <laughs> uh, I got two more things on the docket, and I got to get out of here right around five, so we'll get through these. Um, the... Alistair Overeem still in the news. Uh, there's a few things here. He uh, first of all, let's talk about the picture you posted on Twitter. Uh, I saw a different picture, which calls into question whether or not the picture that you posted was legitimate. It looked photoshopped. I, I saw yours, and it may just be that he's more squared up to the camera, and somebody told him like, "Hey, why don't you fucking flex a little bit?" Like, I don't know, but they are different looking. He'd still look smaller than he does in the. Uh, than the monster that beat Brock Lesnar. Well, the thing about your picture that was really um, disconcerting in terms of his size, that he looked like his neck was all smaller, uh, and then his his forearm looked tiny. Um, and then the picture I posted, his neck looks more familiar, and uh, his forearm his forearm actually looks smaller than I remember it. But um, you know, I, I thought he looked more like the actual Overeem. I, I, it's really hard for me to believe that that wasn't a Photoshop that you that you posted. Calling me a liar, Fagan? I'm not calling you a liar. I'm calling whoever put that picture up a liar. Well, just what I mean. 
it'd be kind of it's possible like i'm not a video editor i can't see those kind of things sight unseen it's possible i just I, the, even in the picture that you posted though he looks a little bit smaller and know. maybe that's because he's not ramping up for a fight right now. Maybe that's because he doesn't have anything to do until December. You know, most guys tend to get fat in between here and there, but that's a lot of muscle mass to maintain. So who knows? I don't it, know, it, man. I'm, I am I just pulled the picture back up and I'm looking at it and he looks fucking huge. Like his forearms look fine. His biceps look fine. His chest looks damn fine. <laughs> <laughs> Erica, looks... do you want to comment on this? No. <laughs> he looks... Alone. He looks big. He doesn't look. Uh, I mean that. I mean the picture you posted. He. I mean, he, he looked a little weird. Um, but yeah, uh, the other issue uh, or issues. Uh, we'll we'll do this. Uh, he's talking about fighting before the end of the year, uh, and it sounds like the UFC is being a little more prudent, given that he's t- technically scheduled to be uh, not suspended, but he's he's denied a license until. Middle of December, I believe. It's and, like the twenty seventh, actually. Yeah. So unless unless he's able to work something out with the commission and get his sentence somehow reduced, which I don't even know if is possible, um, the UFC is not going to book him for a year end show if he's in danger of of not getting licensed by the state of Nevada. No, and that's a perfect example of a little bit of backdoor coordination between the promoter and the commission, which is for them to say, look, we'll we'll technically. We're not going to suspend him past the end of the year, but we don't expect him to be on a show three days after we give him the license back. And the UFC probably just said, OK. Yeah. And, and the, obviously the only other way around it is that they could um, theoretically fight in another state um, in terms of uh, licensing issues. Texas or Florida would be your best bets. But uh, the Fuck UFC, the, well, the like UFC. Florida Florida's not getting any good fights for a while. Yeah. And the UFC is not going to. Uh, take the year end show out of Vegas, which I think has been uh, sort of a tradition for them the last, I don't know, probably like four. I think, well, I feel like 92 was the last really big new year's Eve show or the first really big new year's Eve show. It had two title fights and um, the Vandalay rampage rematch. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I I don't remember what the one was before that. So that's kind of where I go off my baseline of like their big new year's Eve shows. That's the one I always compare them to. Yeah, that show was that's, awesome. That's true. Um, and then the the third Overeem uh, news snippet, uh, he tweeted at Junior Dos Santos. Well, he tweeted at Dos Santos that he was a clean fighter and he was coming for him. But that also came on the precipice of him saying that he uh, he took a drug test uh, with the idea of building confidence with the commission in Nevada. Uh, and then Keith Kaiser, I believe, within the last day or two, uh, has said that they had nothing to do with the drug test. It was self-administered. Um, so it's it, bullshit. It's nothing. <laughs> it just, it's nothing. So that's your opinion on it, that because he did it unilaterally, that it doesn't mean anything? Yeah, I, I uh, brought my probation officer a cup of piss, and she was like, no, that doesn't count. You have to you have to submit it here. Well, assuming, I mean, let's assume that he did it with a, a legitimate testing facility. I mean, I know Quest Laboratories is, is probably the biggest in the country. Uh, or at least one of the more well-known ones. I mean, if he took it to a legitimate company and they verified it themselves, I mean, does that mean anything to you? What do you think the odds of that are? I'm not. I'm just saying, hypothetically speaking, if he came out and said, "Listen, this is who I brought it to," I um, haven't even considered that possibility. If he went to a <laughs> legit lab, then maybe. Well, what, do you, I mean, something. what do you think I he's just, doing? Do you think he's like, like, uh, you know, pissing on some little stick and and it's coming up with a positive sign that he's he's not. He he knows some uh, some drugs. fancy schmancy doctors, man. He might have called up Mister Mol- Doctor Molina and said, "Hey, why? What are you doing? You want to come up here and fucking dip a strip into this?" Well, I feel like at this point, I don't think. I don't think Overeem can be seen with Dr. Molina again. I don't know, man. Is he still do- like, what is the ream going to be for the next six months? Just him eating? What was that? The ream, his little documentary series. What about it? Yeah. What are they going to do now that he doesn't have a fight? I would assume they just collect footage. And then when he actually does have a fight, they'll sort of put that together and show you what he's been up to. I, I don't I don't think we'll see another episode of the Ream until he fights again. I think we will. That's the thing. They it's uh I think they'll do some lifestyle shit, so I think that series is gonna fall off a little bit. I don't watch any of this shit, you know that, but I've heard nothing but good things about the Ream, like uh, the way it's done and everything. It's, so it's it's very, very well done. Um 
you know, considering some of the documentaries about MMA that have been released, like if I think if you put the Reem stuff together as, as one giant movie, I think it would still be a compelling, interesting look at. Uh, have at you the... seen Like Water yet? I have it, but I haven't watched. I, you know what? I've had it downloaded for for a long time. Uh, I've had it for for a few months now, and I just haven't sat down and watched it. Uh, so I can't give any. I think we should both do that and then bring back our reviews next week. Okay, we can do that. Uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about, because it's uh, it's about your boy, uh, there was some controversy about this. Uh, Stephen Struve getting the main event slot against... Uh, what controversy? Well, the what pe- controversy? The people, you- the people in, in the United Kingdom are not happy about it. If you have complaints about Stefan Struve, you come to me. Well, I've, I'm coming to you. What do you think? What's your complaint? That he's 8-3 and three in the UFC? I have no complaint about it. He's fucking awesome. My thing is, it's a U- it's a UFC on fuel show, and this seems like a pretty acceptable main event for a UFC on fuel show. Two well, he's, he's, two yeah. young heavyweights that that have you know some upside to them still. Um, some fuck you, some. <laughs> Twenty four years old, and he's got fucking eight UFC wins. He's also got three UFC losses. Yeah, one of them's to Junior Dos Santos. Who are the other two too? Uh, Roy Nelson and Travis Brown. Travis Brown undefeated. Roy Nelson killer right hand. I mean, I think Struve is a guy who's going to be a, a pretty good heavyweight for a while, but I just don't see him as a. Uh, I think he can. I just a, don't know where his ceiling is. And the exact same thing with Miocic. We have no idea how good that guy can get. Yeah, and that, and that's the thing though. Like it's a it, it's two solid young guys uh, at heavyweight fighting in a main event, and uh, I guess I guess the UK crowd is upset about. Boy, it's not good enough. We want title shots. <laughs> Fuck off. Make your own UFC. Oh, wait, you don't have enough money. That's why all the good fights happen in America, kids. This is the way it's going to be. <laughs> the answer to all of your questions is money. So well, and, 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 that's, and that's my thing, too, is, is it's, a, it's a fuel show. I mean, what, what exactly were they expecting? They were, Hard- so, did they want Dan Hardy in the main event? I think that they would have complained about that, too. Well, they complained. Was, oh, not Bisping again. <laughs> that sloppy cunt. <laughs> Uh, Derek, at, least you're not think... mo- at least you're not mocking the British accent. I got that one down. It's the difference between that and Australian is you just roll your eyes. And you say good day, mate, a lot more. I put another shrimp on the bobby. <laughs> Derek, I think uh, I think that's gonna wrap Cut it the up. Show, hang it up. God damn I it. I got a, I got shit to do. Uh, another date. Another date. You got a, uh, you got any final words here before we get out of here? Um. Watch the show. Don't skip the pay-per-view because you don't like the fights. I don't care how you get it. Go to a bar. Go to a friend's house. You don't have to buy it. Just watch the fucking fights. What if I skip it for for a lady? Uh, run the music. <laughs> oh, and Matt Roth, you can go fuck yourself. Yeah. Not, motherfucker. Not his fault they don't have phones in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs>